Good morning, Ms. Fraser Butlin. Good morning, sir. Um, our first witness this morning wishes to be known as Eileen. Does That's she? correct, yes. Uh, Eileen, please. Please state your full name. My name is Eileen Patricia Dyson. And take the book in your raised hand and repeat after me. I swear by Almighty God. I swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Shall be the truth. The truth. Shall, shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Eileen, you're here to tell us about your infection with hepatitis C. Before we discuss that, can you tell us a little bit about your professional background before you became ill? Yes. Um, before I, I became infected um, and seriously ill, I worked as an international uh, tax manager dealing with expatriates um, in the oil industry and throughout the world. It, it was really looking at how um, the financial affairs of the movement of employees, their contracts, etc. And I worked for a major accountancy firm um, during that time. Um, I really um, was also not only dealing with UK tax, but I was also trained and qualified as a US tax um, advisor. Um, and I met the IRS regulations for the, the um, production of US tax returns as well. At that time, what were your expectations of your future career? Um, it, because there was only um, two people in Scotland with the qualifications that I had, and I'd obviously um, travelled to London, worked with teams in London and uh, abroad. Most of, in fact, most of my colleagues were, at, were based in other countries. Um, I fully intended to become an expatriate tax partner um, and that would have um, obviously um, meant that my, my uh, f financial situation and my family's f financial situation would be of a, a very, very secure standard. In 1988, you gave birth to your first child. What can you tell us about that? Yes. Um, uh, in April 1998, my son, uh, Keith, um, he was... Uh, my my labour was, was 36 hours um, at Bells Hill Maternity, and for much of the time, my husband and I were left on our own. Um, and it, it, obviously, with a first baby, it was, it was very, very uh, traumatic. It was only when the, ba when the baby uh, got into distress that um, doctors were called um, and I was actually taken uh, for an emergency uh, section, um, a cesarean section. And once that was uh, done, um, the, the, because I'd had an epidural, um, they allowed me to see Keith, but then they took the baby away. Um, and they put me in a high dependency unit and there I was given three um, units of blood um, at that time. When you were given those units of blood, were you given any advice about the potential risks of receiving it? None at all, none at all. And then after the transfusion, you became unwell? Yes, that's correct. Um, within a, a, a couple of days, um, I became violently sick um, and um, I was on, a, obviously, an, a normal uh, maternity ward, and during the night um, I was wakened and uh, told that I was being removed from the hospital uh, because I was a risk to mothers and babies. Um, they didn't tell me what was wrong, why, um, and as I say, it was all done for me in secrecy. It was done at night. Um, I was taken in an ambulance. They, they took Keith uh, as well. Um, a nurse um, was taking care of him. 
and the ambulance, tra they didn't tell me where I was going, but they transported me to um, the infection diseases um, ward in uh, Monklands Hospital, which I didn't even know was there. Um, to explain the, the kind of circumstances, um, I didn't know if I was actually going underground um, because there was no windows, no lights, uh, no clear uh, daylight. And um, what they actually did was they put me in an isolation uh, unit in which had sealed doors. The staff all had protective clothing and I didn't see Keith again. Um, they, 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 I, all they gave me were anti-sickness drugs and I was, I was left uh, in that ward. As you say, you didn't see Keith. During that first week of your son's life, did you have any contact with him at all? No. The most callous and traumatic aspect of that was that the nurses that worked in infectious diseases kept telling me what, job, what fun they were having, having a baby to look after when that wasn't their normal job and how much fun they were having feeding the baby, changing the baby, playing with them um, and cuddling them. And I just found it incredulous that the um, women, they knew they were talking to a mother who'd just given birth, who was missing her, her baby, um, to talk in that manner. Um, and and that, that was heartbreaking. After about a week, you were discharged from the hospital. Mm -hmm. um, what were you told at that point about what, was, what had been wrong with you? Well, I, obviously, while I was there, I kept asking them, and they said, well, we've taken bloods, we're doing tests, and as the week went on, uh, they just came in and said, get dressed. And um, the other thing that had made it difficult was that when I'd been moved, they hadn't told my husband that I had been moved. He phoned the maternity hospital and was told she's not here. Um, so I'd only seen my husband through the window using the protective glove screen um, and they, they basically kept both of us very much in the dark so at the end of the week they just told me get dressed um, you must be excited you're going to see your baby um, and I said well can you t what is wrong with me why am why have I been sick um, and they, they said um, you shouldn't be thinking about that now what you should actually be doing is uh, being happy. Just go home and enjoy your baby. And they, they ushered me out of the hospital. There was no doctors to, that I could go to. And because of the actual um, environment that I was in, there weren't any other patients there. This was just an isolation unit on its own. Um, and Ken, Kenneth, my husband, came for me and we went home with our baby. About a month later, you were admitted at the hospital as an emergency. Yes. What happened? What actually happened was I was at home on my own with Keith and the, I started to hemorrhage uh, very, very badly. And um, an ambulance was called and I was taken. And what they discovered was that the postpartum uh, was actually left in after the caesarean and it had become infected and then the lining of the womb had hemorrhaged. Um, so they removed the postpartum without a general anaesthetic, which was very painful, and they gave me more blood. They gave me two more units of blood. You had two more yes. units at that point? Yes. How were you physically during that time? Uh, it was very difficult because I'd had a caesarean section. I was very unwell, um, but I didn't know whether that was simply just because I'd had surgery and I was very, very weak. Um, and because I'd, I'd obviously I'd never had a baby before and I knew I'd had a very long labour, I, I put most things down to being part and parcel of what I'd been through. Uh, but I knew I wasn't well. Um, at all. Um. February 1989, mm -hmm. uh, you went back into Monklands Hospital yes. to have a barium meal test. Yes, that's right. Uh, can you tell us what happened then? Yes. They'd sent me for tests because my, basically I didn't, my, my health didn't improve. And when I went, they said that they saw 
how they termed it, a shadow, um, and that they wanted to do a biopsy. So I had to come back in the afternoon, and I went back, and they took a biopsy, uh, sent me home, and said, we'll, you know, we'll get back to you, we'll let you know the results, and, and that was it. Um, within 24 hours of that biopsy, um, I started vomiting blood and hemorrhaged very, very badly. Um, and an ambulance was called and I was taken uh, to Monklands Hospital and I was put in a ward. And when I was in the ward, they gave me, uh, they gave me milk and they said, just drink milk and you'll be fine. Um, a few hours later, another elderly patient found me on the floor, um, uh, basically vomiting excessive amounts of blood. And so I was put back on uh, to the bed and then um, they cut away my clothes and quickly uh, got me prepared for surgery and took me to surgery. And you had major surgery on your liver? Yes, I did. And um, received 16 units of yeah, blood. Yeah, well, I've, I've since found out that it's actually 30 units of blood that I had. The reason that I thought it was 16 was, um, and I think this will come out later on, is that um, I found that the doctors would just would quote figures to me um, without really checking my records or anything like that. Um, but, yes, I was given large a large amount of blood. Um, the... What had happened was they'd punctured my portal vein and during surgery they weren't able to control. Uh, first of all, they couldn't find where the, the bleeding was coming from and I was losing blood so fast. Um, it was only afterwards when I was in intensive care that I could see that, that basically every artery they could put um, blood into, I had maybe about five in my head, my ankles, my hips, my my arms. Um, basically, they were they were trying to p transfuse blood as much as they could while the surgery was going on. Um, again, were you given any advice about the potential risks of receiving those transfusions? None at all. Um, the hospital trusts have been invited to respond to your statement, uh, and they will be responding in due course. They've indicated that responses are being prepared, uh, and they will be published. Uh, at the appropriate time. While you were in hospital, uh, you were told that you were pregnant. Mm -hmm. What yeah. monitoring were you under during that pregnancy? Um, they told me that, in intensive care, they told me I was pregnant because the um, contraceptive I'd been using wouldn't work because I was so sick. Um, so. After I got home from, I think I was in hospital about three weeks, they then said that I had to attend Monkman's Hospital for Bloods. I had to go, which um, Monkman's Hospital is in Coatbridge. I had to go to Hare Myers in East Kilbride. Um, and I also had to return to Bells Hill in my tent, which is obviously in Bells Hill, um, because I was pregnant as well. But all three, all three places I had to go there um, every three months um, and give blood. Um, I, I asked, can I not attend one hospital? And you can, you know, you're taking the same blood, and you could, you could, try, you know, give them that information. But they weren't willing. They, they basically, they, they were trying to put over the idea of well. Um, you do want your baby um, to be healthy and born. Like you should accept the care that that you know that we're giving. So basically, don't challenge uh, what we're saying. You had your daughter in 1989, mm -hmm. uh, but you were still unwell. Yes. Can you tell us what was wrong? I, I think that um, to say that I was tired is like one of the biggest understatements. I remember trying to explain to my GP and they said, we all get tired. And I said, no, this isn't, this is fatigue. I found um, even trying to wash my hair, I could hardly lift my arms. I could, I could hardly walk any distance. Lifting my ba the babies, um, even just to put them in their cots, um, 
I was like, this is not normal. Um, I had very, very bad pain. I couldn't, lots of foods, it became obvious there were lots of foods I couldn't tolerate. Um, <clears throat> I had a lot of abdom abdominal pain. Um, I, because my liver was compromised, I couldn't take uh, paracetamol or the normal pain relief. And my episodes of pain would be so severe that my GP would have to come and give me morphine and uh, pethidine. And obviously I've learned in later years that to give you that combination is actually quite dangerous. Um, but that was the extent of the pain that I was experiencing. And when you say that you're, you knew your liver was compromised, what are you referring to at that stage? At that stage, all I thought it, it was was to do with having had... They told me that I'd had jaundice at one point, but I, I thought, again, not knowing why I'd been, in, uh, I'd been sick at the time Keith was born, I thought maybe, you know, I've... I've weakened it, or you know, that was about as much as I thought. But I thought maybe that's what's wrong. That I've just, I've, I've still got to recover. Given how unwell you were with two babies, mm -hmm. how did that impact on your care of the children? It had a profound effect. Um, when they were little, um, I would be sick quite often, and I. My husband would prepare um, uh, bottles for Julie um, and put them beside the bed. And if I wasn't well enough to be on, literally on my feet or I was dizzy, I would take the children into bed and make a tent and let them play around me. Um, but what was distressing to me was, first of all, I didn't want them to see me being sick and being in pain. And also it upset me that I wasn't really being a good mother because I would see a sunny day like today and not be able to take them out in the pram or take them to the park. And so it had a, a profound effect on my own self-worth and, and what I saw as being a mother. But from a practical point of view, um, everything that a mother does in looking after babies and taking care of them um, was really difficult. And it was made more difficult um, because um, I, I just wanted to basically get back to normal. I was like, I need to get myself well. I want to go back to work. I, this has been a very hard time for me. But I, and at that time, I thought, just give it time. You will get better. You will. Um, so that was where I was at. Your GP had made a request for you to receive some help from social services. Yes. Did you receive any? What they did was um, they came to the house and I explained to them the difficulties I was having and how hard it was to look after um, two small children. And all that, after the assessment, all they could offer me was to make me, someone to come in and make me a meal. And to me, that was no help at all because at that time I could hardly eat. Um, I asked, like, could I get help with the children? And they said no. Um, and it would actually take another three years before I finally got uh, a place for them at a nursery uh, in the afternoon so that um, while they were in nursery, I could, I could rest in bed. In February 1992, you were referred to the hospital again. Mm -hmm. Can, what happened when yeah. you went there? I was taken in um, for a week. They told me we're going to take, we, we can't get to the bottom of what's wrong with you. Uh, my GP said so. I'm going to refer you to Glasgow Infirmary, and I was there for a week. And they, every single day, they carried out a, a number of tests. They didn't tell me what they were testing for. And each morning, what I found really unusual because I was used to the procedures within a hospital and the and the doctors and consultants rounds in the morning was a group of about eight doctors, eight consultants would come to my bed, um, not talk to me, talk among themselves. Um, and they would, they would um, basically, by the third day, I became impatient and said, I know that you're carrying each test, but there must be something that you've been able to establish at this point. And they said, they wouldn't reply and, and, and walked away. 
one of the consultants came back and said, it's just that you're a, an interesting lady, you're a fascinating uh, case. Um, and one, on one other occasion, one of the doctors um, who was visiting, who was an African doctor, said, have you ever been in Africa? And I had said, no, I, I hadn't. Um, but the actual communication of telling me what they were doing and, or even explaining was non-existent. That inpatient stay was December 1993. Yes, it is. And then a few weeks later, you went for an outpatient appointment in January 1994. Yes. Um, what were you told? When I um, was called in, actually my uh, husband was with me, but um, where you have to park in Glasgow, you need to keep going out to check the meter. So he had just literally gone out to put more money in the meter and I got called in, and there was a group of doctors which I found unusual because it's a, a busy clinic. And I sat down and this, the consultant said, um, I'm very pleased to tell you that we've, we've done all the tests and um, um, so many things that we were looking for you don't have. Um, I'm pleased to say you, um, you have hepatitis C. What was your reaction to that? First of all, I didn't know what it was, so I said, What's, what is hepatitis C? What is it? Um, and they said, um, it's a virus, uh, um, and it's usually caused, it's usually found in drug users or um, in those with many sexual partners. And... Uh, at that point, my husband came in and I, I, I spoke to him and said, they've told me I have hepatitis C. And my husband, like myself, were like, you know, what's, well, what's this about? Um, and I, I said, this doesn't make sense that I would have hepatitis C. I said, neither my husband nor I take drugs. We were married very young. Um, we don't have any other or had any other sexual partners, so I don't understand. How did the doctor respond? The doctors were very, very evasive, uh, to the point that their body language just was one of discomfort. They were uncomfortable that I wouldn't just accept what they were telling me. Um, the, their attitude was very evasive. Um, I, I was waiting for them to explain. All they wanted to do was to talk about going forward. Um, and I was like concerned that they weren't, I said the only other um, way that I could have had infected uh, blood, I said, you do know I've had lots of, of um, blood transfusions. Has anything to do with that? Um, but as you can imagine, I. I didn't you know this, how serious hepatitis C was, and I didn't really, I'd never heard of it, so I was, was almost like grasping for an understanding myself. Um, and they were like, wouldn't respond to that. They wouldn't actually answer my question. They said, no, what we've, what we've got to do is um, think of how, how we're, going, you're, we're going to manage this. And they said, I said, well, what does hepatitis C do? do? What, what will it do? And they said, well, what we will be doing is we will be monitoring you every three months for the rest of your life at this clinic uh, for uh, cancer and cirrhosis, because that's, that's what hepatitis C gives you. And I said, well, is there any treatment for it? And they said, there is a treatment called interferon, uh, but um, it is highly uh, uh, it's very um, uh, difficult and harsh to be given and with, uh, uh, we would think that it wouldn't be effective in your case um, and so there is no treatment um, all we're going, to, we're going to do is monitor it Were you told anything about the risks of transmitting the virus? No, no I wasn't um, I was told that um, uh, about um, using um, like separate toothbrushes but that was it that that was all um, but that was almost like a kind of 
off the cuff remark. It wasn't saying to me, look, these are the lifestyle changes you need to make or that my husband needs to make or it made no reference to the children, nothing, nothing. When you received that diagnosis, mm -hmm. how did you feel? I, I was absolutely devastated. Um, I, maybe some people here know Glasgow uh, Royal Infirmary, but when you leave the building, there is a kind of archway, it's like a kind of concrete, and when I was walking out, I was in tears, but actually I, I, I know I was in shock, because when I got to the entrance where you're about to go out, I actually froze because I knew that once I left, I actually had to go into the world where hepatitis C uh, was very much in the 1980s associated with AIDS and I had to deal with the stigma. I had to go forward knowing that I might not live very long for my children, which was very significant for me because my own father had died when I was eight years of age. And so I knew what it was like as a child to lose a parent. And so I, 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 I was completely in shock. Um, and knowing that the, the doctors that had so flippantly told me that I had hepatitis C, but then sent me away without any support or even any offer of counselling, just anything, just now you go home, we'll see you in three months. And again, I should say the doctor has been invited to respond to this statement and any statement will be published in due course. After your diagnosis, what did you do to find out more information? Um, I think it's important to remember this was before Google. And um, I just went to the library, um, just by the nature of my own professional training. Um, I decided to do my own research. I found two books um, that first of all told me about hepatitis C, but also I found um, something that said you can find out the batch numbers of any blood transfusion that you'd had. So I thought, right, I, I, need, to f I need to find out if the hospital isn't going to help me, I need to help myself. So. I, I did that, and a couple of days later, I phoned to the uh, blood transfusion, the Scottish blood transfusion service, and I had the, the books and the things from the library in front of me, and I asked them if they could help. And what shocked me was just how rude and how um, abrupt they were with me. Um, they wouldn't help me. They wouldn't give me any information. They basically said why was I phoning them and in the first the end of the, the as I was trying to speak to them they put the phone down uh, on me and, and to be honest at the time I thought naively I've just got someone on a bad day I've got I've got an employee who's you know cheesed off and you know, I've been on the receiving end so I waited a couple of days and I phoned them back and I phoned back and got someone else completely different again asking if they could give me some advice and they they said that they couldn't um, I told them where I'd been given the blood and they said that I had never received any blood transfusions they asked for my date of birth and things like that and at that point I just knew I was being lied to um, they weren't helpful at all just this morning, a few moments before the inquiry uh, started this morning, a statement from the Scottish National Blood Transfusion Service was re received responding to your statement. Uh, and they have apologised for your experience when you contacted them. They've said that they wouldn't be able to trace the original donation without the blood component numbers. And they say they don't hold those in relation to your transfusions. You need to have them from your records. However, they've also said that they would be willing to carry out a reverse look back if the blood component numbers were available. In the absence of these, SNBTS believes that the blood transfusion Mrs Dyson received between April 1988 and February 1989 are the most likely source of her infection and offer our sincere apologies. 
Thank you very much. That, that was the reason for the slight delay, I think, this morning. It was, sir, yes. Thank you. Uh, that statement will go up on the website once the team have, have uh, dealt yes. with it as they need to. <laughs> Thank you. That was your experience with the SMBTS. Mm -hmm. uh, you also spoke to a lawyer. Yes, I did. What happened when you spoke to them? Yeah. I, well, when I realised I couldn't get anywhere with the blood transfusion service, I got in touch with my lawyer and explained to them the, the situation. Um, they made their own inquiries and they came back to me and said that um, uh, as it stood at the moment, there was no legal aid available for anyone with hepatitis C to, to um, take a case uh, to court. Um, they told me that a company called Thompson's was dealing with a case, but that it would probably take um, 20, 25 years for uh, anything to happen. And sadly, there was nothing that um, I could instruct my lawyer to do, and that basically my husband and I would have to just, we were on our own and we would have to just live with what had happened. How did you feel after that? I felt completely um, abandoned. I felt abandoned and I also felt um, very much um, of no value in society, um, reject, completely uh, rejected by society uh, at all its levels. So it was the state was basically completely um, dismissing me as an individual, my dignity and my human rights. You've described a moment ago that fear as you left the hospital, knowing your diagnosis. Mm -hmm. But at that early stage, you were able to tell some friends that you'd been diagnosed with hepatitis C. Yes. What was their reaction? I think I was naive. I thought, obviously, my friends knew that I'd been in hospital and uh, the circumstances. And I thought it was better to be truthful, to tell them. And so I did. I told them what, that this was the diagnosis and, and, that, and that was it. But sadly, and to my shock, um, very, very quickly, um, friends just disappeared. Um, it was social events. I wasn't invited to um, birthday, children's birthday parties. Um, different things at playgroups and nurseries, um, it was like I realised that they, I wasn't welcome or I wasn't even invited. You attended the hospital every three months. Yes. Can you tell us what that was like? <laughs> what I had to do was to go with the children um, and the setup at Glasgow Royal Infirmary was was basically um, waiting maybe two hours and more in the uh, waiting area, but most of the people for the clinic to be tested for hepatitis C were drug users, um, and often they would offer me drugs. Um, I was completely traumatised, and uh, just because I didn't, I wasn't part of that culture. I didn't have any experience. I was afraid for my children because I knew that drug users had needles, they had things. So I would, I would literally hold on to the children and keep them close to me for the, the time that I would sit. Um, and that went on for the whole time that I was there. And what was your experience of the staff at the clinic? Um, what was really hard was that um, when I was going in to get bloods taken, they would treat me as a drug user. Um, and that went on for a, a long time, until one day that I went, I broke down, I just started to cry. And I said, you're treating me like a drug uh, addict, and you're, treat you're not recognising that I got infected from a, a, a blood transfusion. And the nurse that was attending me said, yes, we are, because we don't, we, I said, look, how can you? And she said, we have no facilities um, for someone like you. 
Um, it was cold and, and callous. It was, the, it was heartless. You carried on attending there for seven years and then asked to move somewhere closer to home. Uh, why was that? Because I was so unwell. Um, it was really a struggle for me to take the children, to try and find parking, the usual things that everyone who's an outpatient understands. Um, I would be worried that I would be unwell in the, in the hospital because if I'd just had an appointment and gone in and back out, I probably could have managed but the fact that they were making me wait two and three hours um, made it very, very difficult. So I kept asking, could I please be moved closer to home? You're, you're not treating me. You're only taking blood. You're not doing anything. Um, but that was ignored until um, I was finally moved. Because during that whole period, all that was happening were blood tests. Correct, correct. And you've said you were unwell. Can you describe that for us? Yeah. I think um, when, as I say, how it's it's complicated to try and deconstruct what fatigue really means. Um, it means insomnia. It means um, uh, pain that come the onset of pain without any warning. Um, it always meant that I was in in pain basically all the time, and because I couldn't rely on... First of all, I couldn't rely on um, strong pain relief because I couldn't be drowsy. I had to be responsible for very young children, and it would have been reckless to be like heavily sedated or anything like that. So I, I was in pain most of the time, but those episodes of pain, uh, abdominal pain, uh, joint pain, difficulty walking. Um, one thing it was even a uh, sensitivity to light. I had to wear like sunglasses all the time um, at that time. And so, in about two thousand and one, you did transfer over to Strathclyde. Yes, Strathclyde Hospital is basically an annex of. Wisher General Hospital that's in Motherwell and it, it was, they were very old buildings but just a small group of buildings and I was transferred there for them to then start taking bloods every three months. So that's again all that was done and I was there going back and forward but obviously that was easier for me. By that stage after seven years my children were in school um, so most times I could go to an appointment and be back home. In 2007, you became very unwell. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened to you? Yeah. Um, what ha happened was that things developed very quickly. I started to get blockages in my bile ducts, which caused me jaundice. Um, very, very serious infection, which had to be treated with um, very powerful antibiotics to stop me getting sepsis. Um, and I was basically going pe through periods of jaundice, um, not being able to eat maybe for three or four weeks, losing about a stone in weight, um, and waiting until the blockage cleared. That obviously... Um, threw up a, a, f a flag to the hospital because obviously I was being admitted um, a, as an, an emergency patient. And after um, being admitted uh, on five occasions during uh, January and February, it was decided to put in um, stents into my bile duct to try and keep it open because it was closing. That was attempted three times, and three times it failed. Um, but that was the, the stage it was at uh, at that time. During that period of really very serious ill health, you were on holiday in France. Yes. And had to be admitted to hospital there mm -hmm. on uh, one occasion. Yes. What was your experience in a French hospital? Yeah. Um, the, from the moment I arrived at the um, hospital in Auxerre, the 
The thing that was most striking was that every single member of staff that I met, once when they asked for my medical history and I told them I'd been infected uh, with hepatitis C from a blood transfusion, the compassion and the care was incredible. I had never experienced anything like it. And it was every, even with the language barrier, every single surgeon, uh, radiologist, showed nothing but compassion and real genuine sadness that I had been infected in that way. And it was a real eye-opener for me because I was quite flabbergasted because it made me realise how badly I had been treated by the NHS in Scotland and in so many different hospitals because obviously, as you can see, I, I was sent to many different hospitals in different areas. And so it wasn't my experience of one place. It, it was endemic. You returned from France to have the stents put in on three occasions, as you've said. That, no, the, stent, the stents were done prior to France. They were put in. It was after France that they put in a permanent stent. These were temporary ones. Thank you. But by September 2008, you were becoming much more unwell and you mm -hmm. were becoming worried. Yes. Um, my main concern was that was, there was no uh, treatment plan. There was no management. Everything was dealt with on an emergency basis. Um, too often I was being sent home uh, unable to eat with a very serious infection um, and no one monitoring it, no one actually... Um, looking for the danger signs um, and I knew that there was only so many times I could I could get the, um, to this point that I knew I would die. Um, so I decided to phone the British Liver Trust and I said to them, I wondered just general advice, if I could tell you my situation and what treatment I'm getting and if you think that is correct, if that is normal. After they'd listened to me, they said, absolutely not. Um, you are not getting the care that you need. Um, and they strongly advised me uh, to, to get in touch with a liver specialist because it was actually then apparent to me that no liver specialist was looking after me. Um, and they gave me, uh, they told me to um, go to my GP and get a referral letter and see if I could be seen by, at that time, the, the liver unit in Edinburgh, Royal Infirmary. And in October 2008, uh, you did attend the liver unit at the Edinburgh Royal. That's correct. And what were you told? When I went to uh, the liver unit in Edinburgh, I met uh, Dr Blair and she, she epitomises what a great uh, consultant is. She has shown me that there are genuinely good people within the NHS, which I hadn't had up until that time. Um, first of all, she uh, said, you know, she wanted my, my history and she said, what I'll do is... Um, I will get in touch with Glasgow Royal Infirmary, I'll get in touch with Wisher, I'll get all your records and um, we will meet in six months' time and we will decide wh what we feel is necessary because obviously the liver unit and the liver transplant unit are a team that work there. So that's what she did. And when I came back six months later, she said that um, she'd been told by Glasgow Royal Infirmary that all my records had been destroyed, uh, even though I'd been going there for all those years. She said that Wisher General Hospital couldn't give me give them her any documentation. They could only provide some information th uh, through a telephone conversation. So from that point she basically tried to construct uh, from what I was able to tell her in my medical history because she had absolutely no medical records at all. Despite the fact that you've been in Glasgow between 1993 and 2001 and Strathclyde 2001 to 2008. Correct. Since then, have you been able to obtain any records? 
The only records I've, I've received, I actually just received a couple of weeks ago, literally, uh, in fact, less than two weeks ago, um, and they cover a very short period um, in the early 90s. Um, and obviously I have um, the, the medical records from Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, which are in, intact since Dr Blair took charge. Before we talk about the treatment that you've had under Dr Blair, can you tell us what impact the lack of records has had on your ongoing care? Yeah, I think that's a very important point. Um, <coughs> recently, about a year or so ago, um, again, I was admitted on an emergency basis to Wisher General, and the, the consultant and surgeons that saw me um, obviously don't have any records um, and they asked me to, to tell them my medical history which I did what I, I just found astounding was that they said that what I told them was highly unlikely um, to the point that they, they basically ridiculed it they smirked they, they said that ab basically there's absolutely no way um, and when I tried to explain what the scars I had, um, they said they just dismissed it and, and left. And it really, really came home to me then, which something I'd never thought was that the impact of not having your medical records is not something from the past. It's going to affect me for the remainder of my life. You described earlier to me that, that there were both practical implications mm -hmm. but also issues of trust. Yes, I think that um, what it, it, it has done um, has made me very, very distrustful of the um, medical, um, uh, medical staff in general. Um, I now feel that they have to earn my trust. Um, I see the NHS as a service and that they have to prove to me that they are professional. It's not enough. Their, their badge or their title is not, is not enough. Um, but in that occasion, I, I think what makes it very, very um, uh, com complex is the fact that what do you do when you are weak and vulnerable and need medical care, but you can't trust the people who are appointed for that care. Like, I felt I couldn't trust those doctors. And uh, if I did need surgery, how was I going to consent when they didn't believe what I was telling them? You saw Dr Blair again in early, in early 2009. Mm -hmm. What did she say to you about treatment and what happened next for you? OK. She... She, first of all, gave me some medication um, that she thought would help with the blockages I was having, but she wanted to talk about the bigger picture, which was obviously the, the hepatitis C. Um, what was complicated was that she said, um, first of all, she was absolutely astounded that I'd never been offered any treatment. Um, she was very concerned that I... Um, that the hepatitis C could be cleared from my body because she, she's, um, in her judgment, she thought I would need a liver transplant and obviously that would be compromised. If I had a new liver, that would then be infected. So she, she was very keen to address the issue of hepatitis C. What made it more complex was the fact that I was actually very, very ill um, at the time and we talked together for the first time as a partnership for how we go forward. And she said that, and I I've explained to her my concerns about how I would manage on her vony um, and the harshness of it when my body was actually very weak. I think you mean interferon interferon. rather than harvoni. No, the, she, actually, she mentioned interferon and how that wouldn't, it would be difficult for me. She then said... What um, I do want to tell you about is that we're actually trialling a new drug. Um, it's not ready yet, um, but we're seeing very, very positive results. And she put me in touch with the liver 
nurse, specialist nurse, and allowed me to talk through the options um, and weigh up. The, and so I, after those discussions, I decided to wait and see when the Scottish Government would give funding for Harvoni. And while you were waiting, what were you trying to do? The main thing I was trying to do was to get strong. I was trying to get myself as strong as I could be so that whatever treatment I had to get, um, I would, whatever side effects, I would be able to deal with them and be able to complete whatever course of treatment it was. You had to wait until 2015 uh, and then you were able to start Harvoni treatment. Yeah. How did you, um, how did you uh, come to receive that treatment in terms of the funding of it? Yeah. Obviously, I was an outpatient at Edinburgh Royal Infirmary, but I was living uh, um, within Lanarkshire's um, health board. And so Dr Blair explained to me that she couldn't, she couldn't give the go-ahead or the authority, and that in fact I would have, she would have to refer me to Monklands Hospital, so that the team that were there, they would have to make the final decision as to whether I would get treatment. So the first administrative step, if you can call it that, was actually to refer me to a hospital that had the authority um, for that funding. That went through, and then before you had the treatment, you had to undergo a psychological assessment. Yes. What were you told about why that was? The reason I was told that I had to get this assessment was because, because Harvoni was such an expensive drug, they weren't prepared to gamble with anyone that they thought wouldn't complete the, the, the drug uh, treatment period because of their lifestyle or their mental health if they had mental health issues. And the assessment process took about eight months? Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. Once you started the treatment, what were the side effects of it for you? For the first two weeks, I felt absolutely amazing. I could do anything. And I was like, this is... I've never felt like this since I was in my 20s. Um, but after the first two weeks, the headaches, the weakness became very, very bad. And actually, when I had to go back to Monklands to, uh, because they routine, routinely took bloods, um, I couldn't walk. And the nursing staff were actually shocked when they saw how bad I was. In June 2016, you were told you had cleared the virus. But what's your physical health like now? I think that... Um, I obviously I was delighted to be told that, um, and I found that um, I didn't. I, I was actually the, the, the side effects and the effects of the treatment left me very, very uh, weak and ill. And I remember going back to Dr. Blair and saying, "I'm surprised I can't really walk very far, or and I can't do much, um, and I've still got quite a lot of pain and those symptoms." And I would say that th that weakness actually continued until probably as about seven months ago. Um, and it's only more recently that those symptoms have, have lessened. And, but I'm, I still have a very restricted diet. Um, in fact, I have to take medication five times a day to be able to eat. Um, I'm in pain at any time I eat, but with no pain relief. Um, I get blockages, still get uh, blockages uh, that, that give me, you know, a lot of complications. And what's the situation now in terms of your liver and health going forward? Going forward, Dr Blaise explained to me that the medication, I'm, um, she, she, um, she knows that it will not, it's not a solution. It's not a solution. She said it will stop working. And when it stops, then uh, they, or they can see it failing, they will then have to assess me for a liver transplant. How has all of this affected your mental health and well-being? If you'd rather, I can read something from no. your statement. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Please. In your statement, you said this. 
the impact of these experiences of the last 30 years on my mental health is in reality beyond any narrative I can provide. Words are inadequate. They fail to convey the whole truth. And by this omission, the enormity of my pain and suffering remains hidden and indescribable. Yeah. You've talked in your statement about your Catholic faith. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit of how that has helped you or how it has been important to you? Yeah. It's, it's been absolutely crucial to um, my resilience and my strength. Um, I, in fact, last week, my husband and I um, travelled to Lourdes, and most people think that you go there for a miracle, you go, you know, that, that's why you know, people would go to Lourdes, but as a Catholic, um, I actually, my family, we have gone to Lourdes many times um, with the children, not, not for a miracle, not for a cure, but actually to counter the cynicism of living in a state where the sick are so badly treated. When I was in Lourdes, the sick are visible, they're supported, they're cared for and they're valued. And when I would come home, it would help me see that humanity and my faith were right, that there were good people in the world who cared about the sick and not what I saw when I came home, um, where the sick are hidden um, abused by the, the NHS, discarded by society, and that this fight for for justice and for us to be listened to, to, to be heard, um, was I could carry on through through my faith. Can you tell us a little of the impact of the hepatitis C on your husband and your children? Yes. I think I would actually like this moment to publicly acknowledge um, not only my thanks, but to acknowledge the courage of my family um, my, for their care and support. Like all families, they look after their mum. You know, everybody loves their mum and they look after her or do their best. But what it asked of them um, from, from my husband, it absolutely compromised his, his career and what choices he could have because he had to be a carer um, and the limitations that put on him um, for a healthy man who had no need to go near a hospital to spend most of his adult life in hospitals is absolutely tragic. Um, and for a long time, I blamed myself for ruining his life. Um, for my children, um, I, they have looked after me since they were little children. And that is not right. That anyone who's a child carer knows or has seen what children do to care for an adult. That's not right. They, they should have had a carefree childhood, not worrying um, that mummy's sick again. Um, but it wasn't just in childhood. Um, it was when they were uh, in high school, when they were in university. Um, but I think the most profound thing and what, why I say that, that the courage they have is that when they found out, when they were old enough to understand why I was sick, they then had to carry the burden of the injustice of it. And that has ramifications for them in their own lives going forward now that they are actually, both of them are older than I was when I was infected. You told us at the very start of your evidence about your career. What happened to your working life following your diagnosis? After I was diagnosed, um, at that time, um, for a couple of years, I... I tried to get stronger and I actually did. I, I had a spell where my health did improve and I was able to take a, up a post with an accountancy firm uh, to be an expatriate tax manager. Um, and I, my children were in school and I was, I was delighted. I, I felt it was good for my self-esteem, but also because I knew I was very good at my job. Um, and it was such a specialist area. 
um, I knew I could I could return to work. And so I thought maybe I can manage this illness. But sadly, about a year and a half um, afterwards, um, I took very sick again. And I was off work for six months. Um, and it, because I was in a managerial role, it's normal practice that you go for a medical before you can come back to work. And I wasn't worried about that because I'd had colleagues and partners, there was a partner actually at the time, who had a brain tumour and he was very well supported in, in the office and allowed to do staged return or stay off if he needed. So it, it never concerned me. I thought, yep, I know this um, accountancy firm, they understand the procedures. So I went for the medical and obviously gave the, the, the doctor the full history. And when I went to my GP and said, I, would, I think I want to stage, I think I want to try and go back. I got in touch with the HR and said, I'm coming, I want to try and come back. And they said, no, um, we'd like you to come in uh, at some point and have a meeting with the partners. Um, and I came in to see them and um, basically, to cut a long story short, once the partners knew uh, that I had hepatitis C, and if I can just clarify, I'd put hepatitis C on my application form when I'd applied for the job. And I was thinking about this recently, and I wondered if either they didn't read it um, or they didn't know what hepatitis was either at that time. Um, but my application form said that I had hepatitis C. But once HR explained and explained what the doctor's report had said, um, they basically uh, said they were making me redundant because there was no work um, which I, 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 I couldn't I literally couldn't believe um, my medical rec my medical wasn't kept private everyone in the organization knew uh, when I went to clear my desk everyone knew um, and I knew that it wasn't through lack of work um, and in fact, a couple of months after I was made redundant, they transferred staff from Edinburgh to take over the work caseload that I had. Just before you started treatment, you by then had started a PhD. Yes, that's right. Can you tell us what happened with that? Yes. Um, because uh, I... Uh, Obviously, once I knew I couldn't return to the profession that I wanted, um, I decided to um, use my experience for the help of the sick and the dying. And so I went to university and took qualifications in that. I started a PhD on spiritual care of the sick and dying, but because of my treatment and because of the sickness that I had, I obviously had to stop and my studies. Sadly, um, the university said that I had exceeded the amount of time that I could have off and obviously the, the progress that I was able to make. And so because of sickness, my, my um, PhD was stopped. And have you been able to return to anything in terms of work or study since then? Not yet, not yet. What impact has all of that had on your financial situation? I think um, one of the, the greatest uh, difficulties is that now that I face old age, um, I have no pension, I have no savings, um, I can't, my husband and I can't clear our mortgage, um, and Considering the potential and the salary, I have had to be dependent on the benefit system, but more importantly, um, the, the, um, all, my, all my financial decisions have had to be through the earnings of my husband. And so I have had no independence uh, of my own, um, and that's exactly where, where it stands.
You received some payments from the Skipton Fund and from the Scottish Infected Blood Support Scheme. Mm -hmm. You also applied for some funding from the Caxton Fund. Yes. Can you tell us about that and your experience of applying to Caxton? Yes. Um, the, because I had already dealt with the Skipton Fund and I knew the, the procedures, I, I thought that Caxton would be similar. Um, but it turned out to be... I think it was actually one of my breaking points of my um, mental health, I would say. Um, I had gone to them, I'd read their information, and I had contacted them asking if they would give me a, a financial support for education. Um, and what I got back was a means-tested um, document, which in its detail I found insulting for the, the number of things that I had to explain how I was spending money, you know, what, what, what the household money. But because of my own financial background, it wasn't I was intimidated by form filling or, you know, by financial matters. I was quite competent, but it was the nature and the approach. I sent the forms back. Months passed. I contacted them uh, and all that. I was told was, you know, it's in the system. The um, the teams that the group that um, review them only meet once every few months, and then they will come back to you. Um, and so, obviously, I waited. When they came back, they sent a letter saying, "No, we're not giving you any funding." But because we've had a look at your your household spending, um, we really don't think you know how to manage money which I, I just couldn't believe. And they referred me to an online um, service, which was actually run by a woman from her home called Pennywise. And when I spoke to this woman, she basically, her advice was, um, you would manage better if you would can you cancel your husband's life insurance policies, or if you, like basic, absolutely basic things. She said, too many people think they need them and they don't. And as the conversation, I, I honestly was, I was literally, at, is this the level that the state has brought me to? That here I am being told that not only we're not giving you money, but we want to tell you how badly you, have, you are managing your poverty. It, it was... It was, I, I do, I remember coming off the phone and putting my head in my hands because I was like, has it really, are we that badly uh, supported? Which is no support at all. You described it as being offensive and degrading. Totally, totally degrading. Eileen, those are the questions I have for you. Is there anything else you'd like to say? Yes, I do. If it's okay with you, if I can read... Ah. There's, um, there's actually three points that I want. First, I want to speak about the infected and affected, then with reference to the NHS staff, and finally to the inquiry team yourselves. Um, the first thing I would like to say is that the uh, infected and affected are experts in understanding the in impact of NHS policies. They know the NHS truth and how they truthfully operate. Our knowledge is vast and it should be valued. The Scottish Government in 2020, in their vision for health and care strategy, say, stated that by 2020, every person in Scotland is given the best standard of care with the patient at the centre of all decisions. When is our community going to see this person-centred care? With regard to the NHS staff, I would like to see teaching in medical schools and the ongoing training in hospitals for consultants. It must change. I want change. Doctors have no given, a God-given right to hold all the power. These last 30 years since I was infected, were made much worse by the abuse of power of doctors and nursing staff when I was at my most vulnerable 
and my weakest state. If I can turn to the inquiry team, the, um, I wish to raise two points with you, Sir Brian, and your team. Firstly, I'd like you to consider how you intend to record silence in testimonies. When the depth of suffering is so great that all language fails, and what we recognise is that the pause is as valuable in conveying the trauma as the spoken word. This is very important for future researchers who will study the final report in generations to come. My second point is how will the inquiry team quantify the loss of potential? How can you, Sir Brian, and your team really establish the scale of loss for the infected and affected that you are so keen to put first. To demonstrate what I mean, I was infected when I was 29 years of age, and most people here know what stage they were at in their careers at 29. I want to give you two examples. At 29 years of age, John Major, with no university education, and working for Standard Charter would take another eight years to become a government minister. And Nicholas Sturgeon, at 29, was a young solicitor. What compensation would they be seeking today if they had been infected at 29 years of age and their political ambitions had been destroyed? I hope these examples focus the inquiry team and the public's minds on what it truly means to lose your career, your health, and your financial security. Thank you very much. I'm just going to turn and ask Mr O'Neill and Mr Dawson, who are representing you, if they Thank have you. anything they wish me to raise. Thanks. Sorry. There are just two points that um, Mr O'Neill asked, has asked me to raise. Sure. Um, firstly, in your, um, in your witness statement, you've, you've commented and, and noted that you felt that the Penrose inquiry was unscientific. Yes, I do. Do you want to add anything to your statement? Yeah. I think that um, with regard to the Penrose inquiry, um, what I, I see it as a flawed document because... Um, as a researcher and the training I've got is that uh, any document of, of that nature has to have a balance between both sides of the argument and I see that it's, it's a totally imbalanced and it doesn't have the professional rigour that it should have um, certainly any document I would produce wouldn't be accepted if it, it was as biased as the Penrose was and the second point is you mentioned that while you were pregnant with your second child, you had regular blood tests um, from multiple different hospitals. And in your statement, you, you described that your, your concern that that may have been for research. Yes. Would absolutely. you like to explain mm -hmm. that to us? Yeah. During those years, um, doctors would refer to me as an interesting lady um, and um, fascinating you're a fascinating case. Um, any scans, any uh, times I had to be an outpatient, um, they would keep me for hours examined. They would, if I was, for example, having uh, an ultrasound, um, they would also want to check my heart. They would check other organs in my body. They would actually keep me for long periods of time. But, but I actually grew tired of... Um, and it, it was language that was used... 
um, across hospitals. It wasn't a specific doctor or a certain uh, context or environment. I, I knew that they, they were definitely, uh, what I, was, I felt was that what they were doing was to further their careers, that they were actually gatekeepers who were preventing me from getting treatment, but actually studying me um, as a, a case study. There are no further points to raise. Uh, do you have any questions? No, I, I, I want to, to thank you for that powerful account, if I can call it that, uh, of social exclusion mm -hmm. uh, and the difficulties of being a, a mother, which you, amongst all witnesses, have, have highlighted, mm -hmm. whilst being ill. Yeah. Uh, and, thank, and I thank you also for the, the thoughtful points you made at the end, particularly the two directed at the uh, inquiry. Yeah. Um, you'll understand why I don't say anything about the second. Yes. As to the first, uh, I shall give it thought. But it does seem to me that uh, silence speaks in two ways. Mm -hmm. One, silence in the sense of what is not said, mm -hmm. but might be said. Uh, and the other, because silence in itself can be a form of communication when at least it is bookended by, mm -hmm. by words or expressions. And I, I hope that we have that well in mind. Mm -hmm. Certainly, those who have watched the testimony will understand it when I say that a, a lot of the impact of evidence such as yours ha has come not simply from the words that are used, mm -hmm. but the pace, the way they have been delivered, the, the emotion mm -hmm. which goes into it, and the sheer courage uh, of their expression. Yes. Yeah. But thank you. Yes. Very much for that. Could I just say one last thing? Of course. Is that um, although I'm sitting here as a woman infected, um, I see that I represent the family. It's, this is about when you poison a mother with infected blood when she's giving birth, you attack the family. And I, I don't, I, I'm not here just for myself. I'm here for every family that has a gone through this terrible ordeal. So thank you very much. Indeed. Well, we'll take a break uh, now until uh, 12 o'clock. Thank you, sir. At 12 o'clock. <laughs>